of the Source CEO panel. Um, on stage with me today are three distinguished CEOs from the security industry. Um, we're going to hear a lot about what they think, and I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way. So for the most part, I'm going to just try and drive these guys to have some interesting conversation, and we're going to hear what they think. Um, on my right is Patrick Morley. I'm, I'm actually going to let you guys introduce yourselves because I don't have my bios. Um, I, don't, I don't have bios with me. So, Patrick, if you want to tell us a bit about yourself and Bit9. Sure, yeah. My name is Patrick Morley, and I'm the CEO of a company called Bit9. And uh, Bit9 is a company in the enterprise application whitelisting space, which, uh, if you think about blacklisting with AV, we essentially do something slightly different on the whitelisting side, and it's something that appears to be gaining a considerable popularity out there, certainly among the customers and prospects that uh, we're talking to. And we're based right in Cambridge, right down the street. Great, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I'm Josh Pennell. I'm the CEO of IOActive. Uh, we're one of the three firms that are hired by uh, Microsoft to do the uh, Win7 Vista Client Vista Server Code Review. So if you have any problems, just contact me afterwards. I'll see what I can do for you. Um, and uh, we're headquartered in Seattle, Washington. We really specialize in high-end application uh, security review, so white box, black box testing. I'm Matt Moynihan, CEO of Veracode, uh, located uh, in Burlington. And uh, Veracode is a on-demand application security testing company. We do both um, uh, white box and black box testing, uh, but we have an automated solution as opposed to uh, a manual one. Very cool. Thank you, guys. So let's just jump right in. Um, you guys, as CEOs, have a lot of contact with the customers and you probably hear all the good things and all the bad things that are happening out in the world, at least with the customers that you have. Um, maybe Matt, you want to start this one off, but what do, you, what do you find your customers are asking for most? What's their biggest pain? Well, there's a security pain and then there's uh, sort of the budget pain uh, that exists. So I think that you know, what we're finding is a combination of both, interestingly enough, is that uh, automation with accuracy seems to be one of the things that they're asking for, particularly in this environment. And it's interesting because um, being an on-demand company, in many respects, uh, people will um, uh, equate uh, Veracode with a sort of, oh, you're qualified for applications. We love the automation. But how do you solve you know, certain elements of application security that can't be solved by a machine and need a human in the loop? And Veracode's model really does um, uh, believe that there are things that machines can find and find better than humans, but you also need humans for certain things like you know, log business logic issues and applications. So it's really the interface, and particularly in a budgetary environment like this, how do you have a joint solution that leverages all the best of automation so I can get broader code coverage across all of my applications and then actually bring in the human for what they do best, which is finding uh, certain, level, uh, certain types of security vulnerabilities uh, determining exploitability, things of that nature, and all doing it within budget. And so it's an interesting interplay between some of the new technical innovations around automation, but also trying to keep a very important uh, human as part of those uh, application assessments and uh, doing it all within budget. Very cool. Josh, what about you? Um, I, I think what we're seeing out in our neck of the woods is uh, companies are really changed course. Uh, application security is, is being baked into the development process. Um, uh, I think they are uh, foreseeing that there's going to be a point in time where regulation is going to happen. Uh, companies are going to be asked to provide secure code to their customer base and be accountable for that code. Um, in the budgetary space, we are not seeing a decline. I expected to see some kind of weakening in the demand uh, for our services, in particular, uh, sometime in this quarter, but we've actually seen an increase uh, uh, past what we saw in Q4. So I think, uh, I think the people are smell blood in the water and they're kind of shoring up their defenses. Very cool. Patrick? Um, my, my perspective slightly, I guess, adjunct to what, what you guys are both talking about. And I think our perspectives come from where we sit in security. And uh, I, I was spent three hours this morning at a company here in Boston that has uh, about 40,000 employees worldwide. And the biggest theme that I see uh, for particularly large companies right now is they're trying to figure out how do I put it all together. They are, uh, we are an endpoint uh, protection solution, bit nine. And what we see with IT today is that they are consistently surprised at what is going on amongst their user community today uh, from a vulnerability standpoint. And consistently they're trying to figure out how do I take all the different security solutions that are out there in the marketplace and how do I weight what each one's going to provide to me from uh, solving the business problem that I have 
which in, in, ends up being a security problem from their angle, given that they're on the security side. Uh, they are surprised at the breadth of the problems that they have, and they're consistently surprised at what it takes to actually solve what would seem to be relatively simple problems today from a security and a vulnerability standpoint. It's interesting that you mentioned that. I'm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on what you, something you just said right there. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked about security as a business problem. And the three of you obviously are, are business people first and, and security people second. How do you guys see the business landscape um, affecting security and especially affecting the way that you guys do business? And Josh, maybe you want to start off. Um, I guess uh, just given notes from the field here, uh, the interesting thing that we've seen is, for example, uh, regulations like PCI have really uh, gathered the CFO's attention, the board's attention, and what they need to do in that in that space to mitigate risk that's been pushed down to them by the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank saying we're not going to cover fraud anymore. It's up to the merchant to cover those fees. Um, and uh, here's a big set of rules that you have to comply to to avoid those uh, those fines. I actually met uh, the grim reaper of PCI. Uh, he, I was sitting across from him at lunch and I didn't realize who I was talking to until he started talking about the fines that he leveraged against companies and how he was super excited about this fact. Um, uh, one of the cases was an $8 million fine. He called up the client and said, hey, guess what? You lost a bunch of credit card information and uh, now you owe us $8 million. And uh, they paid. And it's just the way it works. So I think from a business standpoint, one of the drivers, uh, kind of sum it up, is uh, you know some regulation that is kind of combining the security world with the business world. And that would be PCI. Yeah, I, I do think we see, um, similar to PCI, a movement by CIOs and CISOs to focus on risk coming from third-party sources and looking for some sort of validation at certain levels of you know, security, whether it be testing or assessments, you know, call it what you will, have been done. Um, you see CIOs, CISOs spending most of their day job focusing on reducing risk internally, and you still have a sort of risk equation. The better you, job you do internally, the more comes externally. And so, again, I think that um, uh, you are seeing, whether it be PCI, um, the fact that you can't um, uh, reduce your liability, uh, you can't uh, hold others accountable for security vulnerabilities that are uh, built, uh, built in over in India or China, uh, you know, procuring third-party software. Uh, all of the risk that's coming from third parties, I think, is going to be really a, a, a topic that's, um, you know, top of mind over the next 12 to 18 months. Patrick, since you started this, what do you think? Uh, I, uh, we, we see it. We tend to see it uh, from the operational guys. So one of the one of the themes that we're seeing right now is that uh, obviously, as different aspects of, of security uh, become commoditized, uh, they tend to be run actually by the operational folks as opposed to the security folks. So security folks are actually making the yes/no decision from a technology protection standpoint, but actually, who's running it is the operations guys, and they are much more dialed in based on what we're seeing right now from a budget standpoint. Um, they tend to have a lot of power because they're running most of the infrastructure for a lot of these companies. And so I think one of the themes we're going to continue to see is the blending of, and again, this is my perspective coming from an endpoint standpoint, we're going to, we're going to see the blending of operational uh, pieces and security pieces as uh, IT customers try and actually operi operationalize, uh, that's not a word, but you get my point, they actually try and operationalize security. And we're already seeing that. You see, uh, uh, you, with Semantic and, and the decision they made with Altiris, you can start to see people are trying to, vendors are actually making the decisions. They believe that security uh, is going to become part of the operational suite or vice versa, however you look at the world. And we're certainly seeing that with customers. Um, and, and a lot of our purchases are done by the operational guys as they're trying to figure out how do I effectively manage what I've got sitting out there, both uh, traditional software on the infrastructure side, but also on the security side. Matt, you. Uh you used one of my favorite words there. And the three of you come from very different parts of security. I mean, obviously, you have very different perspectives. And we all throw around this word, and I'm going to ask each of you for your definition on this. Um, and start with Patrick. Put him on the spot for once. Oh, he's, he's got food in his mouth. <laughs> Maybe you get to start. <laughs> uh, that's a good way to get out, of, uh, get out of being the first one, just so you know. Um, what is risk? <laughs> what is risk? <laughs> Elliot Spitzer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the probability 
uh, that some, yeah, you have classic definitions, right? I mean, the probability of an event happening and the impact of that event or the consequence of that, and you can you know, define it in any way you like. Um, I think the real question is what is acceptable risk? You know, things are going to happen. Uh, what is the probability that those events are going to happen? And then can you live with the consequence of that happening, right? And I think that, uh, you know, obviously I come from the application security space. You know, previous to this, I was at Semantic, which was an endpoint company. And it all comes down to, uh, really, you know, how much risk do you need to bring out of the system with the budget you have? And what's the most effective spend? So, um, uh, I, don't, I don't, there's no magic behind the, the term risk. Um, uh, I think it's really around, in some cases, it's, you know, what does it cost to, you know, cover your fanny? in certain environments. You, know, you, don't get, you don't get fired for hiring Big Blue. Um, and so I think everyone has different definitions, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to, you know, how much money do I have? And with that spend, with that dollar spend, what's the quickest way or most effective way to reducing the attack surface of my organization? Patrick, you, you're nodding your head. What do you think? Oh, I, I think that's an excellent, that's exactly what we see, right? We all have, it's, uh, risk is in the eye of the beholder, and each organization has a different view on what risk means to them and to their organization, what they can afford to actually protect what they believe that they don't have to right now from a, either a resource standpoint or from a dollar budget standpoint that they can't do right now. And I, I think Matt, has, uh, his definition is very accurate. Josh, you have anything to throw? That was a cop out, but that was a good answer. I, I think risk can't be quantified until the event happens. For example, I often wonder what's going through or went through the, the CEO of TJX's mind when you know he's reading about his company in the newspaper losing millions and millions of uh, of uh, client records and getting sued by Visa for $85 million. Um, I think he knows what risk is now. I think, you know, gliding over and make, you know, having a checkbox audit for wireless security and having HR systems hooked directly up to your mainframe, uh, you know, I think those would equate to clear risk in his mind. I've also talked to people who um, have been the folks that were tasked with walking around uh, post event, um, uh, you know, their, their systems were. Uh, warmed the software they wrote, uh, was exposed to a wormable surface, and they were given a check to go around and make it all okay for that uh, software company's uh, clients. And I think you could say that's risk, and, and risk is often equated with you know, clearly numbers. So once an event's happened in a corporate culture, there's a metric that gets assigned to that, and then there's processes and procedures that are wrapped around preventing that from ever happening again. But it's not a proactive thing. It's very reactive. I think that's my point. Awesome. All right, I'm going to switch gears again. Um, Elliot Spitzer is the big news story of the day, but lost in all of that, uh, the Federal Reserve undertook pretty much heroic measures in the last 24 hours to try and boost up the economy. Um, it's clear that everyone's worried about the economy from, you know, from the manufacturing sector all the way to security. And this time I am going to put you on the spot because you're not eating this time. No. Nope. Um, how is how are the how are the economic worries affecting your customers, your business? What are you what are you seeing out there? Uh, we have not yet seen a, a huge impact um, in where we're selling today uh, from the, the economic issues, other than in certain communities. I think in the financial community right now, we've seen a number of projects get pulled back because of the direct impact of what's going on right now with the crisis on the credit side. Um, I think it's, it's making them really focus, customers focus on priorities. And they were already doing this, but I think it's, it's, it's said, hey, if, if it's not in the top three or four or maybe five, it probably won't happen. Um, I also think uh, it, it really brings clarity to uh, the answer that Josh gave earlier, which is the number two, the two top drivers we see are if someone's had an event, so they understand risk, or a com someone's coming in from the side and saying from a compliance standpoint or from an audit standpoint, we're going to tell you what risk is and what, what is too much risk. And if one of those two things are happening in an organization, then they will usually find the budget because it's someone on the business side saying, I don't want my name in the paper, I don't want our company in the paper, or it's somebody uh, saying, no, we have to adhere to a certain regulation. And the number of regulations out there that are driving uh, security is amazing. I mean, amazing the number of acronyms out there right now that are having uh, that people are using when they make a decision to, to do a purchase. Josh, you uh, you mentioned that you guys are actually seeing an upturn in business. Is that what do you how, what do you attribute that to? Are you guys just lucky to be in the top three, or um, is the economy not really affecting everybody, or what do you think? 
I was going to ask you that. Um, I think uh, I was talking to a very intelligent lady yesterday over lunch uh, named Becky Bass, and I said, Becky, what's going on? Like, uh, I was expecting to see a downturn, um, a slowing of some sort, and she's like, Josh, I've been in this business for 35 years. And I'm like, I'm 31, so yeah, she knows what she's talking about. Um, and she said the security market, in her experience, it diverges from the average trend of our, our macro market. So when the, our economy downturns, she's seen the security market uptick because people are tightening up the belt and they start to look at things like bottom line issues like fraud um, and how do they take the machine that they have right now and tune it so it's even more efficient. On the up economy, people are like, well, you know, I guess we could tune that number, but we're making so much money right now, let's just continue to grow the business and not shore up the internal uh, 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 mechanisms. So uh, that was her take on the situation. I thought was uh, pretty in insightful. And like I said, we're not seeing anything right now. Matt, what about you? Yeah, we're not seeing uh, too much either, although like Patrick, there's been some dislocation uh, in the financial services uh, industry, not so much because of budgets, but more because of uh, organizational structure and dislocation. It's been so extreme there that, uh, you know, when you have a shifting organizational uh, landscape, it's tough to uh, have continuity to who you're selling to. Uh, but Vericode's message does tend to play uh, very well in this type of environment, largely because it's essentially a consolidation play. Um, you know, you're moving from a software tools market where you're spending money on tools to an operational expense model with a service. People like the ability to control that, dial it up and dial it down. Uh, a subscription to multiple technologies um, sort of uh, allows you to get two for one, uh, if you will. And then we're all about automation. Uh, and so uh, do more with less uh, tends to resonate. Uh, so we've had some, but not as much as we might have thought. Makes sense. Patrick was mentioning all the, uh, all the acronyms. and. I would be remiss talking to three CEOs if I didn't ask, um, and I'm going to put Josh on the spot. What is, what do you see as the difference or the comparison between compliance and security? Uh, in, in our little world, uh, compliance is really, uh, it can be used in two ways. This is where we've seen it applied. It can be used as a reason to go champion a person's uh, security cause to do security right within the organization. Um, so it's an enabler of uh, security stakeholders, or if it's not a security stakeholder, uh, it, compliance ends up being merely a checkbox routine where uh, people show up with little or no technical background and are asked to fill out a form, check the boxes, make it look pretty, and sign it. Matt, what do you think? What do you see? Well, I think security is a, you know, a, a state uh, relative to you know, sort of, um, you know, risk, if you will, and compliance as a, a state relative to a regulation. Um, and so I think what's interesting is that, uh, you know, we have been in some accounts where, um, you know, they feel like they're compliant because they don't know what's wrong. You know, so there's an interesting interplay with, you know, knowing what's wrong and needing to fix it to be compliant with a regulation versus uh, not knowing and feeling uh, relatively comfortable because you don't know what's wrong. So I think that's an interesting relationship between the two. But I agree with what um, what Josh said. Patrick? I, I think it depends. I think it depends on the sector, and it depends on how, you know, are they a public company, are they a private company, uh, what's going on with them internally. Literally in the last 90 days, we've done, uh, had customers buy because of SOX, because of HIPAA, because of FDA, because of FDIC, and with the new government mandate, it's actually been talked about for a while, but the FDCC, all of these are mandates. You've got to learn all these acronyms. Many, I'm sure you all know all of them, plus more. And uh, it amazes me when you go into different organizations. I think, as one of these guys said, I don't know who it was, but, but you find people who are championing, uh, championing their cause, their project, and they latch on to a particular acronym uh, because it's got business justification behind it. And, and normally, it's gone through a vetting process, and it's, it's valid. Um, but as I said earlier, I think it's a big driver for where we see projects right now. People are, organizations are very concerned about making sure that they can pass whatever regulation, whatever acronym they're up against. Makes sense. All right. Pull out your crystal balls for a minute. What do you see as the biggest change in the security market over the next 18 months? And Matt, I'm going to throw this one to you first. 18 months. I mean, I'll take it out. 36 or 48 months to get a little crazy. Um, 
I think it's obviously I'm somewhat uh, some biased here, and it may even go beyond three or four years. But I do think you'll see an environment where all of us in the room can write code, uh, whether you're a business user or uh, you know a, a, a developer. Um, you have folks like uh, Charles Simony, uh, ex CTO of Microsoft, out there doing some really interesting things. Obviously, we have this whole notion of you know object-oriented uh, development and reusable code and things of that nature. Uh, web services uh, is essentially uh, that same type of thing where you're constructing applications and enterprise mashup from third-party sources of information um, or capabilities that you really don't need a, a very sophisticated technical background to do. And so I think that the biggest challenge, uh, whether it's actually all of us writing code or web services or SOA, is you know, how do you bring security to a, uh, a yet again distributed um, sourcing environment? It's very, very difficult. Um, and uh, you know, getting the same level of trust that's required there uh, to, uh, to uh, make sure that the security posture matches, whether it's your, your regulatory environment or whatever it may be, is going to be very, very difficult to do. Patrick, predicting the future. Uh, again, uh, it all comes from where we sit. So, so Matt, Matt's coming from an angle, our angle right now. I, I think it's it, the easy answer, the flip answer is we're going to continue to see consolidation in the secure on the, on the vendor side uh, as uh, customers demand uh, one stop. Uh, we hear that every single customer visit I go on, they're asking what other major vendors, what are the top security vendors doing in the areas that we're in because you know, customers don't want to deal with all of the different security vendors out there. And so I think one of the big trends will continue to be consolidation. That's an easy answer because we've all seen that go on and I, that's only going to continue. Uh, and again, from our biased perspective on the endpoint, I think you're going to see consolidation on the endpoint where security uh, becomes a factor of a, of a more proactive operational stance. And all I mean by that is if you think about some of the security issues that we all have out there right now, in, in a
All in security, you're thinking the same thing. There is, there is no single answer today. Um, uh, there is, I, I personally think, in the security side, there continues to be uh, an incredible amount of work that's going on and innovation going on, trying to close down the gaps. Uh, and I think what we're going to continue to see in the years ahead as, as the security industry matures is that, as Josh just said, this offensive idea, the idea of being on the offense, um, uh, will, uh, we're going to see that recognized as security becomes more mature. And there is no single answer today, and we all have to really work hard to figure it out, and every organization is different, different and the needs are different. Josh, what do you think? I'm still thinking. Ask him. No, go, ahead. <laughs> go for it, Matt. I think you've been passed too. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I would agree with Patrick. So there's no silver bullet, and I would force um, yeah, I would force technology providers, whether they're technology developers or s solution providers, to consolidate themselves. You know, I think that something that uh, you know Verico started out as a tool, and uh, we explicitly decided not to bring it to market as a tool because it didn't solve the problem didn't solve the complete problem. So we turned into a service company to solve more of that problem. And our problem that we're trying to solve can't be solved solely by a machine. It needs a human in a loop. So forcing that to happen, forcing companies like Patrick's uh, Bit9 and Veracode to come together to some extent. You know, so without knowing Bit9 intimately, uh, these application control or endpoint control companies are moving to doing some very innovative things in grade listing. Uh, but you think about the market, it went from blacklisting to whitelisting, to now the innovations gray listing. Well, what about things like Google Toolbar that may be allowed into the organization by an IT administrator by bringing extra level control to it, but what happens if there's a backdoor in Google Toolbar? Is that really an application you want internally? Why not scan the code by an organization like a Veracoder or others, and then take that metadata and put it into <laughs> Bit9's capability to allow you to do a more robust uh, decision at the endpoint? And so I think that security is the one area, if you look at this, something like 800 different security companies. It's one of the areas of most, uh, the most innovation of any. Um, but again, it, it can't come to market in silos. I think they should, should force uh, consolidation both uh, at the corporate level but also in the uh, technical development standpoint. You're on the spot now. What do you think? All right. I think um, what I've seen is I think privacy on the Internet is dead. I was talking to people who write major search engines, and they told me they could tell the difference between an 18-year-old kid clicking on a banner ad versus a 35-year-old man looking for porn. It scared me. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we've lost that battle with all the spyware and adware. Um, so I think moving, you know, when you think about the internet, it's not like Lisa what I thought it used to be. Uh, so we're being monitored intensively, and uh, we're kind of in the wild, wild west. Uh, we're you know, if we're not dealing with defending our networks and our software from uh, disenfranchised MIT kids, we're, uh, we're dealing with, you know, defending our networks against Romanians and Nigerians, et cetera. Uh, so I think it's, like, it's kind of like we, we established this, this beachhead out in the, in the cyber world, and all of us kind of enjoyed what we had we'd built, and the, the masses have now caught up. The mob was pleased to report that their uh, second quarter earnings in the online fraud division uh, surpassed those of their organized uh, drug trade. Uh, department, so uh, the world's changed, and um, I think that's uh, trust no one, basically, at the end of the day. Okay, opening it up to all of you. Questions? Let me run out with the mic here. I can do this. All right, I'm um, going to use Matt's comments about Bit9 and Veracode working together, and, and Patrick, your comment about consolidation. Um, and here's the question. Uh, having personally spent the last year at McAfee before going small again, um, I've seen firsthand both the, the marketing pitch, if you will, as well as the realities of that consolidation. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of the opportunity of more of a, I'm going to characterize it as an open source, obviously it's not because it's individual organizations, but effectively building a best of breed ecosystem. Uh, where you've got companies that are 100% focused on their particular areas, working much more closely together, trying to, to actually bring to the market best of breed capabilities as opposed to what the Symantec's and the McAfee's are stitching together through what I would, would call a market architecture. So, so is your question whether or not that model can actually exist out there in the future? 
what your thoughts are in terms of the ability to, to do something like that, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you do, well, you do start, we, there, are, there are certainly projects out there today that have that trajectory. I, I think, um, again, what we see is um, uh, it's easier to innovate in a small company than it is in a big company. We've all, anyone who's been at both sides knows that, that that's absolutely the way it works. The customer habits are also all built around those, those, uh, those big companies. And so the, the very fabric of the way that we approach uh, solutions in the security side has to get altered um, in order for our customers to actually want to go out and get these types of solutions that aren't from one of the major vendors. They're already programmed to buy from McAfee or Symantec or Microsoft. Uh, that's who they're, they're buying from today. And it takes big movements, big ideas, and solutions that uh, actually change, the, the, fundamentally change the way that these guys think in order to break that. And I think it's really hard to break it. That's uh, kind of a cop-out answer as well, but I, I just, I, I, yeah. Because in the end, uh, most of the guys that are, if you even look at other, other areas of IT spend where open source or those types of ideas have become much bigger, there's usually a material, a capital side to it that's driving it. Yeah, I, think, I think it's definitely possible, uh, particularly with the advent of web services. I mean, if you look at ultimately the success of many of these products, it does come down to user experience, right? So if you take on, um, you know, and, and be able to, you know, sort of capture the value of combined technologies, particularly in the security space, but underneath the user experience uh, that makes it worth a while. If you look at a lot of the true innovation, you know, BlackBerry, um, you know, Apple clearly, uh, Norton really in its early days, they own end to end everything, right? They own the UI all the way down to the engine, to the content, and it's an, a tight integration between software and hardware, whatever the product is, that allows you to have a really compelling user experience. If it's, user, if it's a positive user experience, adds value, cost effective, people buy it. You buy it, drive down pricing. The other end of the spectrum, you have, you know, mashup applications, you know, multiple vendors, almost an ecosystem, if you will, supplying to a very user-friendly, you know, web interface. You know, people use it. Real estate being an example of that, right? You can get, you know, your average real estate agent constructing some pretty neat applications with, you know, someone part-time helping them do it. In between, you have Symantec and McAfee, right, that are assembling components from companies they've purchased, and it's a product, and they don't own end-to-end. -end. Right? And all of a sudden, you have user experience impacted in many respects. Some integrate companies very well, you know, some don't. And it's not just Semantic and Mac. There's a host of companies, Cisco, who have you know, made their business on acquiring. It's very difficult to maintain that same user experience in that environment when your business model is M&A. And so I, I, I think that there's a, an element at play here that yeah, absolutely I think it's possible to do that. I think it's going to be a question of how much of that innovation comes organically. And how much do you rely on third parties to make that happen? Because at the end of the day, if it's not user-friendly, uh, user I don't think you'll, uh, you'll have the uptake uh, that will be required to get mass adoption. Josh, did you want to throw anything in there? No, I think they covered it. Question here? Um, actually, I, I wanted you guys to comment on virtualization, if you don't mind. Uh, we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of it, and it seems like a very hot topic, but, you know, one of the security <coughs> principles I remember was the more complex and more software you have, the more problems you're going to have, and in, in this case, I presume, some sort of security vulnerabilities, and here we are, everybody's rushing because hardware has gotten so good uh, to, you know, put six operating systems on a server and run three million apps. Uh, I was just wondering what you guys think of that comment. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, we have this mantra at uh, IOActive called what could possibly go wrong. Um, and virtualization is square in the middle of that bullseye. Um, it, uh, virtualization was never built as a security product, um, but it's, uh, people have kind of picked it up like that and somehow it's, it's morphed into the security play. Um, I can tell you that the vendors today are investing money in securing that code base, so it's good. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the Gartner trending reports, uh, virtualization as a security product is up there on the hype cycle. Um, so you'll, you'll probably see more and more investments in that area. Um, currently today, virtual switches and, and all that, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, an area uh, ripe with uh, interesting opportunities. Given uh, every customer I go to, yeah, just about every customer I go to asks that question. So tell me about what your virtualization strategy is. 
And so uh, from a customer standpoint, if the customers are demanding it and asking for it and I'm hearing it, that means every other vendor is hearing it as well when they go and meet with customers. And so the market will react to that and work really hard to fix it. Um, now, obviously the complexities of that environment, just as you said, adds a level of sophistication and work that's going to have to be done in order to solve it, but it will come. And there is, there is a ton of hype around it right now. And some of it very realistic because of you know, what it's doing for companies on the, on the budget side and what it enables them to actually do. So solutions will be there. It's on our roadmap. I'm sure it's on others, others as well as far as having a solution that will work in that environment. Other questions over here? Hold on. I have to run across the room to do this. So um, for years, software companies have had a liability shield from, from lawsuit, and I think that's helped proliferate a lot of the bad code we've seen out there. Do you feel if the government lifted some of the, some of the liability to at least go after companies who are grossly negligent in their development, do you think that'll force the software companies to clean up their act, or do you think that it'll bankrupt the industry? Well, I think you're going to see it, and we're certainly seeing it at Barricode. Um, I think there is a <clears throat> element here of collaboration that's required. Uh, I think it's perfectly, I think the two things that major enterprises need to do when they're forcing or asking or requiring vendors or ISVs um, to improve the security posture of their code is apply pressure because they have it. You know, outside of the top 10 software companies in the world, the vast majority of software companies are not applying um, the right level of security testing to their code. And you know, I'll take bit nine off of this, uh, but I would say some of the greatest transgressors are small security companies. And when you think about it, they oftentimes get the benefit of the doubt uh, that uh, the code is secure. And they're small companies like everyone else. Who can go afford a, a six-figure license for one of these source code analyzers, right? And so I think the second thing they need to go into it is apply pressure to make sure that these folks actually get some validation that the code has been properly tested. And the second thing they have to apply is reason. Because there is an economic model for software companies. ISVs have to make money. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for an enterprise or a government agency to say that I'm not going to accept code that has a severity 5 or a severity 4 vulnerability in it. It's unreasonable. I think it's unreasonable for the CEO of any software company to say, I should feel comfortable shipping code with a severity 5 or severity 4. It's that middle tier, severity 3s and severity 2s, depending on your taxonomy, that may be debatable around, are these security flaws that are exploitable for certain, or is there some element of, you know, discretion around where this application lives and what the operating context is that may have mitigating controls in place to say it's not exploitable. It's unreasonable for an enterprise to force a software company to turn its software development lifecycle upside down to fix those on the spot, but wring them out of the system over time and adopt some sort of best practice that says, you know, for those severity threes and severity twos that may be important, you know, over the course of 12 to 18 months, take them out of your products by implementing better practices in the testing environment um, for, your, for your SDLC. And so I think that absolutely in some cases they should be forcing vendors to get better instantaneously by identifying these flaws. You know, risk control begins with identification, uh, but be reasonable on how far you take that because you'll break the model of the very companies you're, you're sourcing from if you, if you get too, um, too aggressive. Yeah, and I think the market also is driving it. I, I think uh, anyone who's done a large contract uh, with uh, 20,000 or 50,000 endpoints, uh, or even smaller, you know, 5,000 endpoints as of late, who signed a contract, those contracts are, are getting very sophisticated about what they're asking for, even in regards to uh, what that product will do on those desktops. And so, again, as we continue to mature, the industry continues to mature, and, and the operational guys get more involved in it, they're looking to make sure that they're covered and they want you to cover it for them. You are seeing insurance companies get into the fold. There's been a couple recently that have talked about uh, altering their rates uh, depending on the amount of testing or assessments that's been done by third parties. Uh, that's been the holy grail in security for the longest time. You know, can you get Lloyd's of London to stand up and say you're going to get cheaper insurance rates because you've taken some sort of uh, actions, whether it's deploying perimeter defense or getting some sort of manual code review or an automated review, whatever it would be. And you are seeing that recently. So I think that uh, the increase in liability from the TGXs of the world, the share, uh, shareholder lawsuits, um, uh, you'll start seeing more of the insurance industry get behind uh, some of the security initiatives that are out there, and not just the government. I think in uh, 2000, 2001, the, the federal government uh, 
talked to uh, Bill Gates and said, hey, it'd be really great if we could uh, uh, have some secure software. Um, and then Bill Gates wrote the Trustworthy Computing Memo of 2001, and, and the entire company has changed since then. So from that perspective, just a, a market pressure was enough to do it for, say, Microsoft. Um, so hopefully maybe that will uh, apply to the rest of the world. Although I'm seeing marketing from other like competitors to the operating system that you know claim that they have a secure you know operating system, and, and in reality it's kind of the oracle play on the uh, security. It's more marketing investment than anything. So until there's actually some kind of regulated something that gets the board's attention, um, uh, security software security will not manifest to the point where it will benefit the masses. It needs to be a board level issue. Hi. In his keynote address this morning, Richard C Clark postulated that government regulation of ISPs, looking at their traffic and seeing you know, bad traffic, that sort of thing, was necessary to improve security. Do you think this is a role the government should play, or should it just be market driven? My, my ISP has a hard time just keeping my uh, connection. I don't want them filtering anything. My two cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear the speech. I think, I think uh, the market tends to be more effective than the government side. Um, and I think the drivers for many of us who've been in the industry, you know, interesting enough, right, we talked earlier about all of the acronyms that are driving purchasing uh, of different security products out there. But I think the degree to which government gets involved in driving big, broad regulations, particularly around the internet, uh, I, I think it's harder for them to do it. And I think in some in some cases it would be useful uh, for for the market to do it. Um, in many cases, I mean, I think if you look at any feature, particularly security functionality, you know, most of it starts to tenant, start in the applications and sink down to the silicon and then eventually in the network. This whole concept of clean pipes is really interesting, right, if they can do it. But they can't do it in many cases. And then they also make mistakes, as Josh talked about. I don't know how many emails that are legitimate emails have gotten stopped by my ISP. So there's a quality of service issue here. So I think it's always going to be some sort of, uh, you know, uh, partnership, if you will, to some extent. Um, uh, there's, there is no, you know, silver bullet, whether it's a government or private. I think it's got to be a combination of both. Okay. Anyone else have any, have one last question? We'll let these guys go. Thank you, all three of you, for, uh, for coming today and being part of this and answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you.